It is our pleasure today to hear from Colin Raffel. Um, so Colin is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Colin is also a faculty researcher at Hugging Face. And um, well, maybe uh, you might know him from the, the celebrated T5 work um, that, that he did. Um, he's really worked on all kinds of things uh, related to sequence modeling, generalization and memorization, uh, learning from limited data, uh, semi-supervised, unsupervised, transfer learning. So um, I'm sure he's going to have uh, lots of interesting things to, to share with us today. So um, thanks so much for joining us, Colin. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, and I assume everyone can see my slides or else uh, holler <laughs> if there's a problem. Um, and I, I will be taking questions at, at two very clear breaks in this talk. Uh, and so if you do have questions, feel free. I, I think one of the, the TAs is, is fielding them and, uh, and will relay them back to me uh, during the talk. So yeah, thanks again for having me. I, I'm gonna be talking about language modeling and language models, something that I've worked on uh, quite a bit recently and which I think is of interest to a meta learning class. So let me uh, try to explain why. So just to get everyone on the same page, uh, one of the most common ways that people use language models is kind of diagrammed on the screen here. And uh, what we do is we typically take a bunch of unlabeled text data and we apply something called, we call like a, a self-supervised or an unsupervised objective. And what that means is that without actually having to hand label any data, I can just kind of transform my data in some way that there is something interesting to predict from it. So here is an example self-supervised objective where you're going to be training the model to fill in the blanks. So we take this chunk of text shown in green and we drop out some words that are that now have uh, been replaced by blanks. And then in the yellow, you can see all the missing words and we're just going to train the model to fill in those missing words. And so this process, again, doesn't require any human labeling. As long as we have unlabeled text data, we can apply this uh, unsupervised pre-training step, this self-supervised objective. And it turns out that if you do this self-supervised training as a first step before you actually train the model to do something useful, it's incredibly helpful. So this pre-training step uh, it tends to make it so that the model converges faster with uh, less labeled data uh, to, to a better performance on a given task that you actually care about. We usually call these tasks that we actually care about downstream tasks. And we say that we fine tune the pre-trained model on the downstream task. So you can see on the right here, we're gonna be fine tuning on, let's say a sentiment analysis task where we feed the model in a movie review and train the model to predict whether the movie review is positive or negative. And typically we have labeled data in this setting, but it allows us to adapt the pre-trained model to some sort of important downstream task. And this setup is what we typically call transfer learning. I, I will be describing other ways that people use language models, but it, it's, not an exaggeration to say that this is one of the most important uh, applications of, uh, of language models, at least in, in recent years. And so to kind of illustrate that and why that's true, uh, here's a plot over time of the exact match score on the squad reading comprehension benchmark. So this is a, a task where the model is fed a paragraph and then is asked a question about the paragraph and it has to extract the answer from the paragraph. It's what we call, I would call reading comprehension. And you can see that like on most benchmarks, the performance of different models has gotten better and better over time, which is just you know, great and exciting. But I would delineate kind of these results into two categories, the categories before people were using a lot of transfer learning, at least in the paradigm that I described earlier, and, uh, and models that use really an extensive amount of uh, transfer learning as shown on the right here. And you can see there ended up being a huge boost in performance when we shifted to this pre-train the full model and then fine tune the full model paradigm. And the other thing that has made uh, language models particularly useful recently is scale. And as many of you probably have heard or know, many of the language models that we train today just seem to keep getting better when we make them bigger and train them on more text data. So this plot here shows two axes, uh, one the size of the model in blue and in red, the glue score, which is the score on a popular kind of meta benchmark of NLP tasks. And as with squad, the performance has gone up over time, 
But notably, the size of the models that have gotten state-of-the-art performance has also increased pretty dramatically over time. And th there are some issues and questions around this that I'll describe much later. But in general, it's a pretty useful property of a method that the performance tends to get better when you make the model bigger and train it on more data, because it's, it's very easy to get this unlabeled, unstructured text data that we apply the self-supervised objective to. Um, so this, this is a, another factor that has made language models a, a very powerful and uh, popular choice in natural language processing recently. So one particular language model that I helped develop uh, a couple years ago is called T5. And one of the things that distinguishes T5 from uh, other similar models is that we actually use it to tackle a extremely diverse collection of downstream tasks. And it, it specifically, you can think of T5 as having like a natural language interface where you feed it some data and you tell it via a task prefix what you want the model to do with that data. So for example, we want the model to translate from English to German. We want the model to determine whether a sentence is acceptable that comes from the, the COLA benchmark, the corpus of linguistic acceptability. And you can see that T5 specifically uh, casts not only the input as a, a text field, but also the output as a text field. Um, so if we're doing a classification task where, for example, we're classifying whether text is acceptable or not, we actually train the model to output the text not acceptable. Or if we're doing a regression task, like shown in yellow here, we actually train the model to output a string representation of the floating point number. And by applying this kind of text-to-text -text framework to a very uh, a wide variety of tasks, we can take the same model and apply it to lots of tasks and ultimately achieve very good performance on all of these tasks. So since you're in a meta-learning class, this diagram might look a little bit familiar to you. I guess I should say the last diagram might uh, look familiar to you, but certainly this diagram should look familiar to you. Uh, and, and this diagram uh, from the MAML paper is kind of summarizing the key, uh, the key goal of meta-learning, which is that we should si find a model, a set of parameters that can be rapidly adapted to many, many diverse downstream tasks, hopefully with as little data as possible. Uh, and indeed, uh, via the T5 model and, and many other models, we've actually shown that the, the pre-trained T5 model can be rapidly adapted to a wi very wide variety of downstream tasks with relatively little labeled data. So in effect, uh, we have kind of accidentally been doing meta-learning in the sense that just by doing simple self-supervised pre-training, we've ended up with a model that can be rapidly adapted to lots of tasks. And so what I'm going to try to answer in this lecture is why does this language modeling approach effectively result in meta-learning? Uh, you know, we're, we're not using any of the uh, machinery of meta-learning, meta right? We're, we're just kind of training a model on an objective that seems to be useful, and then kind of by accident, it's very readily adaptable to lots and lots of diverse tasks. So, so why is that true? Why is language modeling such a useful objective despite its simplicity? And the, the reasons that I'll, I'll kind of, the, the reasons that I'll try to provide today are shown on the screen here and have been validated through various papers that I'll, I'll be covering in detail. Um, and so the, the kind of, if, if I had to postulate why this is true, I would say it seems that language modeling uh, teaches models first, word meaning, syntax, and grammar, kind of like the basics of language. Uh, language modeling also seems to teach models general knowledge about the world, like facts and trivia uh, and, and even uh, memorized information. And then finally, uh, most recently, what's gotten people very excited is that it seems that language modeling kind of accidentally teaches language models how to perform tasks. So even with virtually basically no additional training, uh, language models seem to be able to perform a, a wide variety of tasks in some cases, which is quite interesting. So I'll try to give you some demonstration of these uh, different properties, try to explain why they might happen uh, and, and, and use that to answer this larger question of why language modeling is, it seems to be an effective way to do, to, to produce a meta learner. So first I'll focus on this, this uh, first facet. And to do that, I'm actually gonna go back even further into the history of of uh, models for NLP and describe word vectors. So for those of you who worked on NLP before the era of BERT and other pre-trained models, you probably encountered word vectors. 
And the idea and the goal of a word vector is to associate each word in the vocabulary with a single fixed length vector of continuous values. So you can think of it a vector in, in some you know, d-dimensional space. And you want these vectors to reflect some amount of meaning about the word that they represent. And, and I'll describe what I mean by meaning in a second. But first, I'll just say that the, the objective that we use actually is you can think of it kind of like a self-supervised objective uh, that's not so dissimilar to the way that we train language models now. We might have a chunk of text, unlabeled unstructured text shown on the top here, the dog and cat ate pot pie. And the way that word vectors, uh, one way that word vectors are trained shown on the screen here is that we model the probability of the word eight given the word cat as a softmax applied to a matrix V that comprises all of the word vectors, the dot product of that matrix times a different word vector for this kind of pivot word, the center word cat, W cat, and then we index this softmax at the eight location. So, so I'm, I, I'm using cat and eight as indices here. I hope, I hope people are comfortable with that. But you, to, to sort of recap, we're taking a center word like cat, and for each word within a window around cat, we're saying that the probability of that word given cat is computed by taking the, a word vector for cat, computing its dot product against the entire collection of word vectors that we're learning and computing the softmax of that. And that gives us the probability of that particular word. And so over, we're basically optimizing both V and W cat in order to maximize the probability uh, of words that co-occur in our, in our pre-training corpus. This particular word vector model is called a skip gram word vector model. There are other ways of learning word vectors, and this is by no means the, the best per se, but it, it is an effective one and, and hopefully is uh, pretty intuitive and easy to understand. So if we do this word vector pre-training, then we end up with some interesting and useful characteristics for our word vectors. And these examples are actually taken from a different word vector model that's a, a little it takes a little more explanation, so I'm, I'm not going to describe it here, but it's called GLOVE. Uh, skip gram word vector models have similar properties. It's just that this one had some uh, nice diagrams that I stole. <laughs> uh, and, and the first is that word vectors seem to capture word similarity. So if you take, for example, the word vector for the word frog, and you find all of the, the most similar word vectors, according to their, let's say, their cosine similarity then the words that you end up with are shown in the list in the top left. So frog is most similar to frogs, okay? So plurals and singles, singular uh, forms of nouns are, are similar, that's great. But frog is also similar to toad, latoria, leptodactylidae. These additional scientific looking words are the names of different, uh, basically the names of different frog species. Um, it's also similar to lizard, for example. So you can tell that the model kind of knows that a frog is some kind of uh, 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 is, is similar, like the word frog is similar to more specific descriptions of frogs and also animals that are similar to frogs like toads and lizards. So that's quite interesting, right? Again, all of this sort of fell out of a simple self-supervised objective that just said that words that co-occur, uh, sorry, words that uh, are surrounded by similar words should have a similar representation. So you might imagine like a sentence, the frog hopped across the road and the toad hopped across the road, right? So frog and toad appear in similar context there. Therefore, their word vector should be similar. And therefore, uh, we end up with this property that toad is essentially the, the most similar singular noun to frog uh, in it, according to our word vectors. The other property that people like to point to in word vectors is that the relationship between different word vectors uh, that have a certain the, the, the sort of uh, spatial relationship between word vectors that have some particular linguistic relationship is very similar. So for example, the displacement between the word vector for strong and the word vector for stronger is similar to the displacement between the word vector for loud and the word louder. Uh, so you can see that these uh, kind of, if, if you take an adjective and you convert it to a comparative adjective and then into and from there convert it into an, uh, a kind of the, the most superlative form of the adjective, you end up with similar displacements. So this space of word vectors ends up having a lot of 
a very interesting and useful structure. And you can imagine that feeding these word vectors into a downstream model, instead of let's say one hot vectors that represent word identity, would imbue the model with a lot of knowledge about the meaning and relationship of different words. And again, all of this just falls out of the intuitive notion that if two words appear in similar contexts, they might mean similar things, or at least their vectors should be similar. So after word vectors came a model called ELMO. And the motivation for ELMO is that when we create a representation of a given word, we actually probably want to take into consideration not just the all of the context that the word appeared in during pre-training, but the specific context that that specific word appears in a particular sentence. So for example, it, uh, well, let me just wait till the next slide to give an example. First, I'll describe the model. So the, the difference between the ELMO model and a word vector model is rather than having a specific fixed set of word vectors, we're actually going to feed our sentence into a model that will represent the words in that sentence with uh, different vectors on a sentence by sentence basis. And the way that ELMO specifically does that is by taking two uh, RNNs, one going in the forward direction, one going in the backwards direction, and feeding the sentence into the two RNNs and using the hidden states of those RNNs as the vector representation for each word. And during pre-training, the objective used to train the model is basically a next step prediction objective that goes in the forward and backward direction. So the forward LSTM, the forward R current neural network, tries to predict the word cat from the prefix, the dog and the, uh, there's a missing the there. Or actually, no, I think I didn't have the in my example sentence, but at any rate, the, the forward LSTM tries to predict cat given the history and the backwards LSTM tries to predict cat from what came after it. So this is kind of this autoregressive kind of next step prediction style language model pre-training is usually what people mean when they just say language model pre-training. But the key uh, distinction here for ELMO is that it happens in a, both a forward and a, a backwards direction. And because a given word can have a different representation uh, based on the sentence it appears in, you get this very nice property that the word vectors become contextualized is, is what people say. So for example, with glove word vectors, the ones that I showed the, the frog example earlier, a given word vector only has one representation. It doesn't matter where the word appears in a, in a given chunk of text, it always produces exactly the same representation. And so if you do this nearest neighbor thing uh, that we described earlier, where we take a word like play and find the nearest neighbors, you can see that playing game, games, play, players, plays, player, play, football, multiplayer are, are the nearest words. And you can see that these words actually are kind of semantically different in some cases, right? So playing is a, is a verb, a player is a noun that, uh, that maybe is a, a, a part of a game, um, but there's also other forms of the word play that might appear, for example, like a theatrical play. Uh, and, and you can see that there, this model ELMO, which they're denoting the bi-LM, the bi-directional language model, ends up producing a uh, contextualized representation of play that finds that, that can be used to find similar uses of the word play. So for example, the nearest neighbor for play in the first example uh, is, is shown in, in the second row there. And for the second example is the, is the on, on the bottom row. And you can see that, in, for example, in the bottom row, it's talking about a Broadway play and, and the nearest neighbor, the nearest contextualized word representation neighbor is from a chunk of text talking about, again, a, a theatrical play. Um, so uh, again, by using a maybe slightly more intricate uh, architecture, uh, but still a very simple self-supervised objective, we can get this uh, nice ability that the word vectors become contextualized. And hopefully it's, it's intuitive to see why, why that's true. And now the, the last model that I'll talk about in terms of explaining how language models learn, uh, you know, word meaning, grammar, syntax, et cetera, is the BERT model, which I've made a, a very simple schematic of here because I won't be going into a ton of detail about it. But in BERT, we feed our sentence, the dog and cat ate pot pie. And instead of training the model to predict what comes next after a prefix or what came before after, according to a suffix, uh, 
we actually are just going to take random words from the input text and replace them with a mask token, which I've denoted by these this M surrounded by less than or greater than. And in BERT, the goal of the self-supervised pre-training objective is to predict the masked out words from the words that aren't masked out, right? So if you saw the sentence dog and blank ate pot pie and you needed to fill in that blank, maybe you'd fill it in with cat, maybe you'd fill it in with boy, I don't know. But either way, you would hope to be able to figure out the identity of that word from its surrounding context. And so you can think of this uh, as probabilistically modeling uh, the word cat according to the equation on the bottom there, basically just that we're predicting cat from the surrounding context. And a key architectural innovation of BERT is that rather than using a recurrent neural network like ELMO, it uses a, uh, a layer type that we call self-attention. And again, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about self-attention, except to say that what self-attention allows the model to do is refer back to arbitrary input positions when generating a new representation for a given position. So, and I've kind of denoted that with these, uh, line, these lines connecting the different nodes in the, the yellow model here. Uh, but you can think of it as, as, you know, if I need to predict the, uh, if, if I need to fill in a, a missing word, then maybe it's most valuable for me to look at another specific word or another few words. Uh, because, you know, maybe it's a pronoun and I need to figure out what word the pronoun refers to uh, or, or something like that. And, uh, and it turns out that this form of self-attention is a much more efficient way of bridging dependencies in sequential data than a recurrent neural network, which has to store all of the information about the sequence in its hidden state. And so one type of analysis you can do with self-attention models or attention models in general is basically looking at what position in the input the model is attending to the most when it generates the representation for a particular entry in the output sequence. And so this uh, nice paper analyzed many of the self-attention patterns in BERT to try to see what kind of things uh, BERT was attending to when generating representation for a particular word. And interestingly, if you just look at the, the word or words that the model is most attending to at a given position and treat that as a classifier to try to identify things like uh, um, which word does a pronoun refer to, for example, or, uh, or you know, which verb does a, uh, sorry, which noun does a verb apply to and so on, you actually get very high accuracy. And you can see some illustrations of this here. So this to me suggests that BERT has some, has learned some knowledge about grammar and structure and syntax of, of language um, in the sense that uh, it, it, it has figured out without any explicit supervision that when it's generating the representation for a particular word, there are specific words with specific relationships that are most useful for predicting that particular word. And, and that maybe gives it this kind of knowledge, uh, which is quite interesting and useful. And again, it, it falls out of a, a pretty simple self-supervised objective. So hopefully that convinces you that various types of language models or things that are used for modeling language uh, teach the model uh, word meaning, syntax, and grammar. Uh, before going on to the next bit, I'll ask if there are any uh, questions about what I just said. Cool. So I think I'll go ahead and uh, carry on then. So the next thing that I mentioned that language modeling seems to teach language models is world knowledge. And when I say world knowledge, I, I kind of mean a, a broad set of things, but uh, to try to be a, a little more specific, I, I'm talking about kind of learning facts about the world. And some of these might be, you know, trivia facts, some of them might be very, very specific facts, some of them might be, you know, general purpose things, properties of, of well-known things. Uh, to give you a very specific example uh, shown on the screen here, uh, for example, maybe knowing the birthplace of Dante. Uh, you know, this is a, a very famous person and uh, their birthplace might be a, a well-known fact about the world. And Typically in the past, when people have wanted to store this kind of relationship, a common structure to use as a, a knowledge graph 
Uh, knowledge graph is a way of storing relationships between different entities like Dante and Florence. So you might say that uh, Dante has the born in relationship with Florence, meaning that Dante was born in Florence. And a, a knowledge graph is a very useful way of representing these kinds of relationships, but they typically require at least some amount of uh, construction by hand. You know, and, and there are some incredible knowledge graphs out there in the world that, uh, that involve a lot of uh, human labor to, uh, to create. But what people have started to notice about language models is that language models themselves kind of build an implicit knowledge graph. And so, for example, if we train a language model like Elmo or Bert, and we feed the language model with a uh, sentence like shown here, Dante was born in blank, you might imagine that if BERT is going to do a good job with its self-supervised pre-training objective, it needs to be able to fill in that blank. And in order to fill in that blank, it needs to know where Dante was born. So the model actually is kind of trained to learn facts indirectly in this way. And indeed, language models do seem to learn a lot of facts this way. So to put it to the test as to how well these language models pick up facts, we actually took T5 and applied the following evaluation procedure. So after pre-training T5 on a self-supervised objective, much like the fill in the blank objective I described at the beginning of the talk and similar to the objective that Bert was trained on, where we take a chunk of input text and we randomly remove words and replace them with mass tokens and train the model to fill in the missing, fill in the blanks basically. We then evaluate the model basically by uh, training it to predict the answers to questions without any additional context, and then testing it to answer unseen questions. So for example, we might ask it, when was Franklin D. Roosevelt born? And we evaluate the model on how well it predicts the year 1882, which was Franklin D. Roosevelt's birth year. So since we're only feeding the model this question, we're not feeding the model any additional context and giving it, we're not giving it any access to any external information whatsoever. You might imagine that the only way that the model can predict the year 1882 correctly was if it saw the fact that Franklin D. Roosevelt was born in 1882 at some point during its pre-training. And so you might imagine that if the model was trained to fill in the blanks in the sentence Franklin, President Franklin blank born blank January 1882, maybe it has somehow internalized this knowledge. And so this kind of gives us a test of uh, kind of a, a real world test of how much knowledge a, a language model uh, internalizes. And it also allows us to use standard kind of off the shelf question answering benchmarks. Most of the time, at least before uh, we wrote this paper, when people would evaluate language models on these benchmarks, they would allow the model to access external information, either by feeding in some context that actually contained the answer, like in reading comprehension, or by providing a way for the model to look up information in an external collection of knowledge. Like maybe you could think of it like, like searching Wikipedia and finding an article and extracting a paragraph and extracting the answer from the paragraph. So that's what people call open domain question answering. We are calling this closed book question answering because you're not allowed to open the book when you're, when you're answering the question. So if we evaluate a various sizes of T5 on this task, you can see that uh, we actually don't do as well as the open domain state of the art on, on any of these three kind of standard open domain question answering benchmarks. Uh, we, we do a, a bit worse in every case, but notably, uh, you can see that as the model size increases, kind of as we go from light blue to dark blue, the model's performance reliably gets better, which suggests that larger models tend to internalize more knowledge than smaller models. Uh, and, and just to be more specific, you know, T5 base is a model with a few hundred million parameters. T5 XXL is a model with uh, about around 11 billion parameters. So we're, we're varying the size by you know, two orders of magnitude or, or so. And you can see that uh, models do tend to apparently internalize more knowledge as they get larger and larger. So we thought this was interesting, right? Because we're doing kind of respectably on these benchmarks compared to an open domain state of the art, despite the fact that we have no access to external knowledge or information whatsoever. So we really, you know, in order to do well on this task, T5 really needs to have learned all of this information uh, during its pre-training. But we wanted to know if we could do a little better. Uh, so we took an idea from a paper that came out around the same time called RELM, uh, which stands for Retrieval Augmented Language Model Pre-Training. 
And the idea behind uh, the idea here is that rather than just picking words randomly to mask out, you intentionally remove words that kind of look like entities. Uh, so maybe in this example sentence here, we removed the person's name, Ana Santos Aramburo. And the hope is that by intentionally masking out kind of phrases that correspond to entities, the model will learn more information about entities specifically. So if we take one of the models that I just showed on the last screen, and we do additional pre-training with the same mass language modeling objective, you can see that the performance, and that's shown in orange here, you can see the performance doesn't increase much, it kind of just stays flat. But if we do the salient span masking pre-training where we intentionally mask out, you know, chunks of the input that correspond to entities, you can see that the performance on these downstream uh, question answering benchmarks just tends to increase and increase. So if we take the largest model and and we do some additional salient span masking pre-training, you can see what happens in the purple bar here. And you can see that we actually go a significant way towards closing the gap with the open domain state of the art uh, by, by doing this additional pre-training step and actually on web questions, ultimately beat the state of the art by just a small amount, which is quite exciting, right? Because it means that this model, this model that this very large model actually has enough information in it that it can get better performance than a model that can actually look up the information. So it's better at looking up information in its parameters than a model that's looking up information, let's say like on the internet or, or on Wikipedia. And just to kind of make the results a little more optimistic, we'll just quickly point out that the way that these models are typically evaluated is by measuring whether their output matches after some normalization one of the annotated answers for that particular question. So you can see here this, uh, in this first example, the model's being asked what the ghost of Christmas present sprinkles from his torch. The possible answers are either little warmth or warmth and our model predicted confetti, that's clearly wrong. But there are actually cases where the model can output kind of a, a synonym or a paraphrase or you know some text that means the same thing as the true target, but it gets counted as incorrect because it doesn't actually match the target. So for example, if the correct target is Kate Mulgrew, but the model predicted Catherine Kiernan and Maria Mulgrew, it gets counted as incorrect, even though those actually do refer to the same people. And so if we went through and looked at some of the uh, examples that were being counted incorrectly and categorized them according to these different categories, if we basically count the things that it actually got correct as correct, and remove the things that there was no way for it to get correct, then our score actually goes up significantly and, and actually outperforms the open domain state of the art. Um, open domain question answering models don't suffer from quite the same issue because most of the time that ground truth annotated answers are annotated according to the text that the model is actually gonna be extracting the answer from. So all this is to say, that it really does seem to be the case that language models learn lots of useful world knowledge through their pre-training. And it's not too hard to get the model to retrieve that knowledge and answer questions correctly. So a, a natural question to ask after that is, okay, so the model picks up lots of kind of what we might call like trivia knowledge, like general knowledge that you might, that applies to well-known entities and so on. And another question to ask is, does the model also pick up a lot of not so general knowledge? That is just kind of very, very specific knowledge that maybe doesn't appear that many times on the internet. Most people, in fact, almost no one would actually know this, but the model nevertheless memorized it. And so we wrote a follow-up paper that attempted to answer this question by studying the GPT-2 model released by OpenAI. And our basic goal was to see whether feeding a particular text prefix into the model could make the model output something that was clearly memorized, you know, that clearly only appeared a few times on the internet and was not general purpose knowledge like Franklin D. Roosevelt's birth date. And I wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't true that the model actually does memorize stuff. So here's one example where feeding and a kind of nonsensical prefix caused the model to output the name, email address, phone number, and fax number of a real person. Uh, and this particular chunk of text only appears on one website 
on the internet. <clears throat> so how did we find uh, these examples of memorized text? Uh, I won't go through this in a ton of detail, but I'll just describe what we did at a high level. Uh, we fed the model with uh, various prefixes. These prefixes were either sampled randomly from the internet or were uh, generations from the model itself. Uh, then in order to identify completions that seemed likely to be memorized, we compared the uh, perplexity or the likelihood assigned by the model to its own generations to the score assigned by a different model, right? So if you imagine I have two models and these models were trained on just joint training data, a model that is outputting something that it has memorized might assign a lot higher likelihood to that memorized data than a model that wasn't trained on that data at all. And so we compared these likelihoods or these, complex, these perplexities across uh, different models in order to hopefully find text output by a given model that it thinks is unrealistically and unusually likely, that it really shouldn't seem uh, as so likely. And then according to this score, we chose some examples that we thought were particularly likely to be memorized, performed an internet search. If we found it somewhere on the internet, we asked GPT-2's authors if it was in the training set or not. And that's how we ended up identifying a bunch of text uh, that GPT-2 output that appeared in the training set. And so just to give a more uh, concrete example of, of what this kind of comparison of scores method might do, you can see uh, on the x-axis here, the perplexity assigned by GPT-2 to a, a particular example where a lower perplexity means that the model thinks that it's more likely. And the entropy assigned to a particular example by Zlib, where a higher entropy means that Zlib thinks it's, it's less likely. And so you can see there are these examples here that are kind of on the top left of the graph are examples where GPT-2 thinks it's very, very, very likely and Zlib thinks it's very, very unlikely. And so if we kind of look at a bunch of those examples uh, you, uh, that have been highlighted in uh, blue and red, you can see that a bunch of them actually did end up being memorized training data from a GPT-2's training data set. So this is a, a pretty effective way of, of identifying uh, memorized content. And one other result that I'll, I'll highlight from this paper is that kind of by coincidence, there was a one document that we found on the internet that just had a list of a ton of URLs. And we knew that this document was in GPT-2's training data. We confirmed it with the authors. And it just happened that a, a bunch of these URLs were duplicated in this document. And, and the amount that they were duplicated varied from URL to URL. So you can see on this table here, we're showing one URL that was in this document eight times and one URL that was in this document 359 times. And we know that GPT-2 was trained on this data. And fortunately, the authors of GPT-2 trained models of varying sizes, all the way up to one and a half billion parameters, the Excel model. And what we found was that the likelihood that a model memorized a particular URL uh, was much higher when it didn't appear as many times for the largest model. I think I might've said that in a slightly confusing way. So the, the much less confusing way to say that is that larger models need to see examples fewer times in order to memorize them, is what, the, what this particular result, this kind of accidental result suggests. So just as with models picking up world knowledge better as they get larger, models also seem to memorize not so worldly knowledge, just kind of specific facts in the training data, specific data in the training data, uh, specific text from the training data as they get larger. It's kind of easy to cause this memorization to happen, uh, which is uh, interesting, maybe good, maybe bad. Uh, uh, we can discuss that later. <laughs> so hopefully that convinces you that language models learn facts. Uh, I'll stop there again to see if there are any questions about uh, anything so far. Um, I think there's a question in the chat. Um, when correcting the evaluation of T5, what do you mean by unanswerable uh, prompts? Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I didn't uh, I didn't cover that just in the interest of time, but I'll, I'll mention it now since I, I, I know it was confusing. So if a model isn't allowed to look up information on the internet, or at least look up information in the fixed knowledge source, 
and I ask the model something like, who is the president of the United States? There's no way to answer that question without providing it with additional information. For example, what year it is, or just providing it with a fixed knowledge base to look up the information in. So those questions aren't really a problem for these open domain question answering data sets because all of these data sets are shipped with a fixed knowledge source that is basically a snapshot in time. But since our model, uh, the, the, its knowledge source is whatever its pre-training data is, if you ask it what the president is, it, it thinks that the president is whoever was the president at the time that it was pre-trained. Um, and, so, and so it can get those questions wrong. Uh, more broadly, you can just think of them as ambiguous questions uh, and, and they're not answerable by a model that doesn't have access to external fixed knowledge. Do we want to ask some questions? Yeah, um, so just to follow up on that, so is, it, uh, or is, is that accomplished just by hand labeling, um, which questions are unanswerable and um, you know, the, which answers count as uh, you know, phrase mismatches? Yeah, exactly. Or is there some way to do it? Oh, yeah, we, we, we did not attempt to do it automatically. We actually, the other first author and I sat down and just, you know, spent a day doing it. And we, we actually released our annotations so you can go and, and see if you agree or disagree with us. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, one more question in the chat. Do these models just memorize or can they also learn rules such as basic arithmetic, such as you are in all math equations? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the I probably will wait to answer that question until um, after the next section, because I think the next section goes some way to addressing that question. Uh, this might not be like a meaningful question to ask, but is it kind of possible to see or to like think about how um, so you said that the knowledge is kind of stored in the parameters? Is there I guess, like how, um, you know, is there like a structure or some way that, uh, you know, different parts of the model or different, you know, layers or whatever store different pieces of information? Excuse me. Yeah, there has been some follow up work that has attempted to either identify whether knowledge is localized in a model or whether it's possible to more intentionally localize knowledge in a model. Um, that's not work that I've done or that I've looked into a ton of detail, but, I, but I happy to be, I'd, have to, I'd be happy to send pointers uh, after the talk if, if you follow up with me. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on to the next section, but then I'm, I'll be happy to take uh, questions after the talk. So hopefully you're now convinced that this simple self-supervised approach causes models to learn things about language. It causes models to learn things about the world. Now we'll try to see if it causes models to learn actually how to perform useful tasks. And so this, the setup that we use to answer this question is somewhat different from the transfer learning setup that we've mostly been using so far. In, in, in this particular setup, which we call zero shot evaluation, we still pre-train the model with an unsupervised objective where we, and in, in this case, but it, However, that unsupervised pre-training objective is now somewhat different. So rather than, for example, masking out words, we do something a little more specific that looks kind of more like what people think of when they say language modeling, which is just that we train the model to predict what comes next. So we feed in some text. This is just a continuous block of text. And then we train the model to predict the following text. So it's, it's kind of just being trained for next step prediction. It's what people usually mean when they just say language modeling without qualification. And the question will be, if we train the model in this way, can we uh, prompt the model in a particular way that elicits a correct response to, for some particular task? So here I'm showing a natural language inference task where the model is being asked whether it's possible to infer a particular statement from another statement. So this is a classic natural language processing task and it's being converted to a question answering format. So if, if you imagine that somewhere on the internet, someone asked this model, someone wrote down a question and the answer after the question, which is not unreasonable to expect, and the model was pre-trained on that data, then maybe the model starts to learn how to answer questions. And so if you ask it a question like this, maybe it will predict the word yes as more likely than the word no. 
And in doing so, it's essentially labeling this example from natural language inference. It's labeling that the banker contacted the professors and the athlete uh, allows one to infer that the banker contacted the professors. Okay, so uh, by doing this language model pre-training, this next step prediction pre-training, we can cast tasks in a particular format that allows us to evaluate thing, uh, evaluate tasks without doing any additional training, right? So I'm just feeding in this new context to the model and seeing if it uh, predicts the answer correctly. And you can cast, just like with the text-to-text -text format from T5, you can cast lots of tasks this way, right? And so actually uh, question answering tasks are a natural fit for this because question answering tasks consist of a question followed by an answer. So to give an example, uh, if we take trivia QA, which we used in the paper I, I described uh, a, couple, uh, a little bit ago, and we just feed a large language model questions from trivia QA and measure how often it predicts the answer correctly, uh, it actually gets the answer correctly a pretty significant proportion of the time. So these are results from uh, the language models or few shot learners, also known as the GPT-3 paper. Uh, and one of the major characteristics of this paper was trying models of varying sizes up to an extremely large model with 175 billion parameters. And sure enough, just like we saw with the closed book question answering results with T5, the performance of the model tends to increase as the size of the model grows. The difference here is that there was no adaptation step for GPT-3. You know, after doing language model pre-training, the model was just fed questions and it, and it was evaluated on whether it answered the questions correctly. And it does uh, quite well in trivia QA specifically. It also does quite well on lots of other tasks. Uh, in, in some cases on natural language inference, like I just described, on things like paraphrase identification. So do these two sentences mean the same thing? Sentiment analysis, you know, is this movie review positive or negative? Really on a huge variety of tasks. So the conjecture therefore was that this unsupervised language model pre-training kind of produces a model that is effectively a multitask model. It can perform lots and lots of tasks reasonably well. And I think when a lot of people interpreted these results, they sort of thought of GPT-3 as doing this kind of by magic because it is becoming kind of like a more and more powerful model. And so it just knows more and more and more things. Um, and that it, it, it kind of achieves this magic through uh, unsupervised pre-training. But I've started to try to push a different perspective a little bit, which is that actually it's pretty likely that GPT-3 saw examples, saw what we would probably call labeled examples from lots of tasks during its pre-training kind of by accident. So on this slide, I'm showing some text that appears on websites on the internet. Uh, these examples actually all come from a data set called C4. We couldn't perform this analysis on GPT-3's data set because it wasn't publicly released. Um, but at, at any rate, this is text that appeared on websites on the internet at some point in time. GPT-3 was trained on text from the internet. So it's not unreasonable to think that GPT-3 might have been trained on text that looks something like this. So for example, you can see that there's text on the internet that looks a lot like closed book question answering, like who is Frank Sinatra, an American singer, actor, and producer. Uh, paraphrase identification, someone's asking, do these sentences mean the same? And then provides the two sentences, uh, natural language inference, uh, summarization, uh, and so on. Uh, these are all, nat these are kind of classic NLP tasks that. GPT-3 was evaluated on, but this is data that appears on the internet. So it seems not unlikely that GPT-3 was actually kind of accidentally trained in a kind of supervised multitask way. And that might go some ways towards explaining why the model can perform lots of, uh, lots of tasks after unsupervised pre-training. But now the question becomes, if I just train a model with multitask supervised training intentionally, will I get a model that can perform new tasks that it hasn't been trained on or that I, I don't think it's been trained on and it generalized to new tasks kind of in the meta-learning sense uh, that, that, that are unlikely to be in, in the training data or at least, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and to try to answer this question, we introduced a new model uh, called T0. And the basic idea here is just that we're gonna take a model that was trained with unsupervised pre-training, and then we're gonna train it explicitly via supervised multitask learning. And then we're gonna evaluate it 
in terms of its zero shot performance on new tasks that weren't included in the intentional multitask supervised training step. And just like with GPT-3, with this zero shot evaluation paradigm, we're going to cast all of these tasks as into what we would call like a prompted form. So this is a way of taking an example from the data set and mapping it to some input and output text that kind of describe what you want the model to do in human readable text. Um, so for example, for paraphrase identification, we feed in the two uh, questions in quotes, and then we say, pick one, these questions are duplicates or not duplicates. So if I presented you, a human, with this text and, and you, you know, spoke English and knew uh, how to identify paraphrases, you would be able to tell me that those two sentences are not duplicates. And so we do the same thing with T0. We map things into this format and we train T0 to output the, uh, the corresponding text. And then finally, after doing this multitask pre-training or intermediate training step, I should say, we evaluate its performance on new tasks that weren't included uh, in the multitask training step. And just to give you a sense of the tasks that we included, here are uh, kind of a shown in yellow are the tasks that we actually did uh, did pre-training on uh, for the for and, and yellow or blue, I should say. And then in green are our tasks uh, and data sets that we did not uh, train the model on at all. So those are the, the data sets and tasks that we're going to be evaluating the model's performance on. And you can see that we actually, we tried to get a pretty diverse collection of tasks during pre-training with the thought that that might Im uh, improve the model's zero-shot task generalization abilities. So the next thing we had to do was actually take data from all of these data sets and come up with templates that allow us to map them into a prompted form. So for example, going back to the paraphrasing example, uh, we, you can see in green here, we write a template that says, take the first question and the second question, and then write the text, pick one, these questions are duplicates or not duplicates. And then we measure whether the model assigns a higher likelihood to duplicates or not duplicates. Um, and you can see that we can apply this kind of templating procedure uh, to a pretty wide variety of, of tasks and data sets. Uh, we actually kind of crowdsourced this procedure, uh, found a bunch of people who wanted to contribute, and ended up uh, writing uh, over almost 2,000 uh, templates for almost uh, 200 data sets. So now the question is, does T0 outperform uh, GPT-3 in terms of zero-shot pass generalization? So we looked specifically at uh, these four tasks shown on the screen here, that's natural language inference, story completion, co-reference, and word sense dis disambiguation. And uh, you, there are uh, two models shown in green. One model is basically you could think of as just the base uh, T5 model, and then T0, which is the model that had this additional intermediate uh, multitask training step. Um, and first of all, you can see that doing the multitask training greatly improves the model zero shot a task generalization, which suggests that training on this kind of tasky data does improve the model's ability to perform new tasks. And then interestingly, we also outperform GPT-3 on a lot or match the performance on a lot of these tasks. And that includes the largest GPT-3 model with 175 billion parameters, which is 16 times larger than T0. Um, so it does seem that actually seeing this, uh, this supervised multitask uh, data allows the model to perform uh, better generalization to new tasks in many cases, despite being much smaller. So it might be a more efficient way to induce this zero shot generalization behavior. And it suggests to me at least that it's possible that one of the reasons that GPT-3 does zero shot generalization at all is because it actually saw a decent amount of multitask uh, supervised multitask training data during pre-training. We also evaluated the, uh, the T0 model on this new benchmark called Big Bench. I won't go into a lot of detail on these results, except to say that, again, uh, T0 outperformed kind of standard language models that were over six times larger. So just to recap what I've described so far, I've sort of argued that language modeling effectively results in a meta-learned model, uh, maybe because language modeling seems to teach models about uh, language, also about world knowledge, and also probably teaches the model explicit multitask supervision uh, for, 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 di uh, for different tasks. And the other thing that I've kind of 
sneak snuck into this discussion is uh, is what happens when we make language models larger, and it seems that language larger language models actually tend to learn more world knowledge, right? Because the larger variants of T5 performed better on the closed book question answering task. Uh, they also seem to learn more esoteric facts, right? Like uh, GPT-2, the larger variant of GPT-2 seemed to have memorized more data than the smaller variants. And it also seems that as models get larger, they learn to do more tasks, or at least they perform better uh, in terms of their zero shot performance on, on, on downstream tasks. And what I'd like to highlight is that world knowledge, like the, the knowledge that the model picks up and the esoteric facts that the model learns and the, the tasks that a model is actually trained on, these are mostly a function of the data that the model is trained on, right? Like if I just take a randomly initialized uh, language model, it's very unlikely that the model is going to be able to tell me Franklin D. Roosevelt's birth date without any training. So in some way, at some point, there was some data that taught the model when Franklin D. Roosevelt's birthday was, or what someone's address and phone number was, or how to perform a particular task. Um, I say mostly because, of course, there are other, lots of other factors here, but the data certainly plays a very important factor. Uh, so then I guess one question to ask is, given that larger language models perform these capabilities better, how large do language models need to be in order to achieve kind of what we want them to? So just to give an example of what we might want a language model to be able to do, let's say that we actually want to use a language model as a closed book question answerer, and we want it to be able to answer questions about any uh, data in the Wikidata knowledge graph, which is a very large knowledge graph with lots of knowledge in it. This knowledge graph can be compressed to a file using bzip that is about 68 gigabytes. If you imagine that the best case uh, ability of a language model to store knowledge in its parameters is about as good as the compression abilities of bzip, 68 gigabytes corresponds to about 17 billion float32 parameters. So this is a large model. It's not gargantuan, but it's, it's quite large. So it, at, and, and actually, you might not expect a language model to be able to compress data as well as bzip. I mean, who knows? But at any rate, you do actually need a pretty large model in order to uh, achieve certain goals. Whether you actually want a language model that knows all of this or not is sort of up to you. But at any rate, uh, sometimes a scale seems somewhat necessary. The, the problem with scale is that in order to train a large model, uh, we often need to collect lots and lots of data, and it's very hard to audit that data. And so as, as people have figured out, uh, pointed out rather, in, for example, the stochastic parrots paper is that as we amplify the training data, as we make the training data bigger and bigger to train these larger and larger models, uh, the training data can start to, it's harder and harder to make it so that the training data doesn't have problematic characteristics and the training data becomes basically inauditable, uh, which is, potentially dangerous and problematic for actual like real world uses of these language models. And then the last point that I'll make is that people are very excited about large language models these days and lots of people are training them and uh, releasing products based on them and APIs based on them. And most of these language models are, as far as we know, very similar. They're very large transformer based language models. The main difference between these models is really just the data that the model is trained on. And indeed, as I described earlier, the data is probably a major, major factor in all of these useful abilities that I've described that language models uh, have, like their knowledge of uh, facts, their ability to perform tasks, et cetera. But most of the time, people pay relatively little attention to what data they're actually training their models on. So I guess this is all to say that uh, thinking more carefully about the data that we're actually using to train these large language models would probably be pretty fruitful. So I, I know I'm just about out of time. I'll, I'll end there. Um, and I'd like to just mention, uh, I'm trying to collect feedback on my talks. So if you have any, if you think I talk too fast or too slowly or covered too much or too little or too technical or not technical enough, uh, please go to this URL here and provide me with anonymous feedback. I greatly would, would value it. Um, and I'm happy to take a, a couple more questions now. Yeah, I, I have one quick question. I mean, thanks a lot for the talk. It was just super interesting stuff. Uh, get to kind of see how and how and when these models just vacuum up knowledge or when they don't from their data sets. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you talked about this sort of phenomenon where knowledge ends up embedded in the model's parameters. This is really interesting that this happens, but I'm curious if in practice or sort of in future sort of work on modeling that we do, is this kind of, you know, in your opinion, kind of the right way to get knowledge represented in our models? Or when you see these retrieval augmented models or sort of semi-parametric models, does this feel like kind of the more practical way to, to you know, get this type of behavior or how do you sort of contrast these two sort of paradigms of like purely parametric and having the knowledge explicitly represented yeah so it's not clear to me that um that purely parametric storage of knowledge is the most efficient or exact way uh to do it and and certainly it, it has various disadvantages like it's there's been a lot of good and interesting work on this, but it's still not totally clear how to selectively add, update, or remove knowledge uh, in this kind of like distributed uh, parameter representation. Um, so, so I I would definitely hesitate to say that one approach was better or worse. Um, the main benefit of building up knowledge in this way is that it requires basically no uh, it, 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 it basically requires that you collect a lot of unlabeled text data and apply a self-supervised objective to it. Um, that, you know, it's much less cost intensive and labor intensive to do that than build a knowledge graph or build a very clean collection of knowledge. Uh, of course, it also carries its own risks and problems like I highlighted at the end of the talk. So I guess that's a very long way of saying that I, I definitely could, see both of these approaches um, having advantages and disadvantages in certain situations. Um, there's one question in the chat. What do you think will drive future progress in language models? More scale? Do you think grounded language learning is promising? Yeah, so you might have gathered from the end of the talk that actually I think we will, a lot of progress can and should be made uh, with large language models by being more careful about the data that we train them on. Uh, for example, you can think of T0 as just being a lot more careful about the data that we train the model on, and we ended up with a model that was 16 times smaller but worked about as well or better than GPT-3 in many cases, uh, you know, because we were intentionally doing multitask learning instead of doing it by accident. Um, grounded language learning, to me, feels like definitely a way to teach the model things that it would be uh, practical or impossible to provide the model with via text alone. Um, you know, it, it, we, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to be efficient or easy for a model to learn everything there is to, about the world just by reading, reading lots of text. Um, I'm not saying that it's impossible, it might just be less efficient. And so, uh, and, and, you know, an efficiency does matter a lot. So, um, that all that is to say that, uh, uh, I, I, I agree that grounded language learning would be useful, um, but there are lots of other useful things that we can do too. How can the multitask demonstrations be extended to under-resourced under languages on the web? Yeah, so we haven't, so there have been, there's been a parallel line of work measuring the kind of zero or few shot transferability across languages. That's not something that we specifically have studied, uh, although I, I, I think it's super interesting. I think combining some of these uh, approaches to doing uh, zero shot task generalization with approaches for doing few or zero shot uh, language generalization would, would be super interesting. Great. Um, if, I guess if there are no more questions, um, we, we can end there. I know people find it to, to run and Colin, I know you're extremely busy. So, so thank you so much just for you know, sharing that hour and, and change with us. Uh, it was it was packed with packed with knowledge. Um, yeah, and uh, and I, I I usually say at the end of the talk, it, people can feel free to email me too with any additional follow up questions. And I did I dropped the link to the talk feedback in the chat in case anyone wants to do that. Um, so, but thanks again for having me. It's 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 really fun. <laughs>